ocean clay. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to be presenting this research to you all. Um, uh, pro I don't know, perhaps different than, um, maybe not, uh, than some of the views that you've been getting. Um, today is going to be something of a mixture of, of history of economic thought and thoughts about what makes institutions work, especially our liberal institutions that have been associated with, in the least, um, the rise of capitalism and the rise of welfare standards across the world. Um, there's a lot of subtlety to what supports institutions and not surprisingly, I think a, a lack of appreciation can occur if you're not uh, careful looking at the details about how we got where we're at. Uh, so with no further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and get started today. Uh, oh, a whiteboard, no, that's not what I was looking for. Uh, try that again. Can everybody see the full PowerPoint on the on the screen? Hopefully, uh, I've got the this up here. Okay. Um, can everybody hear me on the the computer here? Yeah, we're all good. Okay. And I want to make sure before I move on that you can actually see my PowerPoint. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Everybody can see the PowerPoint. That's great. So today, uh, the title of today's talk, a little bit different than what was on the schedule, but still the same topic matter. Thought this was a bit more apt of a description. Uh, virtue and civic discourse and the roots of liberalism. Um, so we're, we're probably accustomed to thinking about liberalism, maybe not so much in terms of ethics and virtue anymore, uh, but in terms of things like free markets and democracy. Um, I spent a lot of time in my research um, thinking about what allows institutions to appropriately function, um, especially when we think about informal institutions. Or in other words, these are the, the informal means of, of how it is that we coordinate amongst one another. So just sort of, there'll be some terms I'll attempt to unload today. Uh, one of these being institutions. What do I mean by an institution? Well, an institution you could think of something like a, a social coordination device, right? It's that thing that lets you know that you walk on the right side of the sidewalk or you drive on the right side of the road um, in really simple terms. Um, so before I go on, it says my screen sharing is paused. Can everybody see that I moved to um, hopefully a new slide that says a theme? Uh, Okay, I'm just gonna keep going and, and if for some reason it's not seen, I'm, nope, okay. So it did actually pause the screen sharing when I went to the PowerPoint view. I may need to uh, just move back here. So, stop share screen, PowerPoint, and try this one more time. all windows, maybe that'll fix it. Okay, so um, I don't have the share content from my screen option that I usually use when I teach. So I think I'm just gonna have to leave the PowerPoint up like this. Um, and we'll just go through slide by slide. Okay, but that looks okay. All right. So I'm be running through a theme today. And this is, there's gonna be a, a couple elements to this. One is gonna be theoretical. How is it that we actually organize as community members? And, um, but the other part is actually gonna be empirical or meaning historical, right? Um, what is the case in history where we've seen diverse communities actually approach one another and whether or not it was their intention, uh, generate consensus about the issue that was being discussed, okay? Um, so we'll be looking at England after the time of the Glorious Revolution. Maybe you've heard about the Glorious Revolution in your own experience. Uh, Glorious Revolution uh, was an event where the, the King of England um, was changed uh, peacefully. And so um, there was uh, some discontent about the policies of King James II um, and sort of seeing uh, 
what the discontent was. Uh, he ended up being replaced peace, peacefully by William of Orange. You, you hear William and Mary. Sometimes you hear about William and Mary. That's the, this William and Mary. Okay. Um, and during this period of time, we, we've, over the previous century, had seen increasing um, um, move in sentiment um, and participation to local levels. Um, groups across England were growing more and more diverse. Power was becoming more and more distributed. And you see this formally get represented by the changing of, of the regime to a new king and one who, who tended more so to cooperate with parliament than the previous kings. Okay, so this is the scenario. And, and it so happens that these diverse groups that were engaged in conversation uh, were having this discourse about virtue. Uh, um, and I, you'll see through the talk today that it's not a coincidence that this, this emphasis on virtue preceded the liberal order that we see today, okay? Um, there was a lot of different views on what virtue should look like. We had diverse communities with diverse commitments to, vir uh, to virtue. And it's in the working out, again, not, uh, if you would have asked participants if they worked out a common view on on virtue, they might not have uh, said as much, but implicitly in their conversation, they ended up uh, generating a, uh, a shared view about virtue that predominates across the century and leads to the freeing of, um, you could say, increased liberties for individuals under the regime, and with that increase um, in commercial activity. Yeah. So to understand how that happened, we, we need a framing. We need to say, well, what is it that's actually coordinating shared perspectives? Okay. Um, and you might hear about this a, a few different ways. Some will refer to it as the social contract. Maybe you've heard Jean-Jacques Rousseau writing on the social contract and before him, um, Hobbes, who we'll discuss today, his work on social contract. Yeah. Uh, I, in previous work, and actually what sort of encouraged me to engage in this process, is uh, the, uh, this work from James Buchanan, Nobel laureate James Buchanan, on uh, moral community and moral order. And he was really concerned about understanding how people coordinate outside of market mechanisms, right? After Adam Smith, especially a century or more after Adam Smith, um, economists have had the strong tendency to, to rely on market ordering and say, well, that, that does a lot of the work and perhaps we don't even need to be so concerned about the others, other forms of organization. Um, we tend to, to get the most efficient outcomes through market ordering and through competition. Uh, but Buchanan was uh, truly concerned about how adjacent to the market ordering or participating alongside the market ordering um, in groups, communities could generate um, shared understanding, shared, shared means of cooperating and how communities of communities, we could put it in those terms, right? We could think of the United States in an ideal sense when things are actually functioning well. We could think of the United States as a community of communities, um, participating in what Buchanan would have uh, identified as the moral order, right? Now, of course, uh, from what I just said, this would imply when things aren't functioning well, maybe we're uh, not operating as a community of communities. So uh, we, we have to be able to have some flexibility from the ideal state. Um, in, in England, you see the same sort of setup. Um, you have a lot of different communities, whether we identify these communities as congregations. This was especially growing in prominence across England, uh, the congregational church. Instead of being involved in a, a, a tall hierarchy, uh, churches were being run at the local level increasingly because the, after the Reformation, um, one of its manifestations in England, for example, were, were a growing Calvinist church among other denominations. And those churches were managed locally, which means that, uh, you know, as a community member, you have a sense of ownership of your church. You're not just subject to your church, but you're participating in, in democratic processes within the church. Right? But of course, there's more than that going on, right? There's businesses and business organizations that are growing in terms of their influence, in terms of their wealth, um, their ability to participate effectively at the national level, right? So all of, all of these pieces are together. And so we can think of England as, as a, um, the social fabric is including diverse communities, overlapping communities. And it's that those overlapping communities 
that lead to a, uh, that distribution of power, which, which moves us away from despotism, right? Despotism is where you have a strong monarch. Uh, despotism is sort of the ideal um, of uh, Hobbes in some sense, um, toward more participation across the social spectrum in governance, right? Increasing, and, and you can see that all the way up to today, right? The ideal is that we have more and more access to the democratic processes, to civic organizations, all in, in some ideal sense there, and to markets. Yeah. Uh, so we begin with Hobbes. We we'll want to understand what was going on in England at the time. It's actually this transformation um, from the, the idea that we need that strong monarch to help guide the morality. So Hobbes, in, in some sense, um, Hobbes wouldn't think of me as a Hobbesian, but in a general sense of like the problem of social contract, I am, I am confronting the same problem Hobbes was confronting. And that's that, what do you do with violence? Uh, and, and how do we have a prosperous society where people um, tend to cooperate rather than devolve into conflict? For Hobbes, the worst possible state that a society could end up in was civil war. And now it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a coincidence that he, was, uh, he published his work in 1651, which was right in the middle of the, you think of the English Civil War, or just after a decade of civil war. Yeah. Um, but what we see in England after the Glorious Revolution is a different kind of rule. The sovereignty of the despot is now being dispersed. And, and there might be some disagreements about how it should be dispersed, just, but just as a matter of fact, sovereignty is being spread over organizations and being embodied in democratic processes. So the, we live in a different world, not one where the sovereign is trying to coordinate the power of the state and the, and the ideology and the, the norms and morals of the religious order, right? For Hobbes, the religious order would have been operating in submission to that. Uh, but we live in a polycentric order, right? This is Eleanor Ostrom who did a lot of work on this, uh, on the idea of a polycentric order. And in the polycentric order, um, again, you have many organizations competing for power so that not one single organization is able to uh, dominate the society um, to bring benefits to one group at the expense of the others persistently, right? In the political game, you engage in transfers uh, but when you're in a polycentric order, the tendency is for uh, uh, transfers not to as negatively influence those who are being taken from. And since everybody is sort of participating in the transfer game, um, you know, depending on, on the ideology that you, you approach with it, um, you, you at least see more, improve, more general improvements of welfare, even if the system isn't operating at some ideal um, level of perfection. Okay. So my claim, and, and what we're going to work through in the, the remainder of the discussion here, is that uh, by identification of the bounds of agreement, implicit in civic discourse, parties to discussion clarified universal expectations embodied in the Anglo moral order. That is to say, we have moral communities, we have these diverse communities, I described a number of, of types of communities that existed um, across England at the time, they're engaged in this conversation about what good governance looks like. And, and there is significant buy-in from all parties about, uh, what, about good governance requiring virtue amongst those who rule and amongst those who are ruled, okay? Um, or you could say, um, probably a nice way to think of that, those who rule and citizens who in some sense co-participate in the rule, okay? As opposed to subjects who would be more like in the Hobbesian world, right? You're subject to a despot, you're subject to a strong government. But in this world, the, the world of the, the new Anglo moral order, you're a citizen and you're participating and everybody's saying, well, what's required for virtue and participation, right? And, and how can we establish society in such a way um, that our, our citizens tend to be virtuous and that the government is tending to promote this virtue? Okay, now that, um, or at least that this virtue is generally promoted, if not by, if not by the state directly. Okay. Now, my argument is that we see the reflection of this in in literature. Okay. So I'm, I, you could say, well, Professor Caton, uh, why should we care about virtue in this historical context? It's not obvious to me that virtue mattered at all at the time. And what if you're just making it up? What if you're just sort of picking your quotations from from articles, but uh, in books? But if you actually knew the whole distribution 
a different story would emerge. Um, so what you see here is actually data from Google Ngrams. And I have um, uh, uh, different groupings of words relating to virtual, liberty, and commerce, and showing their rate of appearance across all literature, okay? Um, I have these words represented as a scatter plot, those dots on the screen on the left axis. And I have those, uh, uh, the lines, the averages, represented on the right side of the screen, on the right axis. And what you can see is, while it's, it's uh, these grouping of words represent a relatively small proportion of the whole language set, right? This is less than 1%. Um, the proportion of usage is changing over time and in ways that coordinate with historical events. So I have three events marked here. One event is the execution of King Charles I. Okay. The next event is the Glorious Revolution. And the event after that is the American Revolution. And, and I, I hope you notice some trends about uh, how these words are appearing across the text. Uh, the most prominent is that across the 17th century, uh, we see virtue um, growing, and actually across the 16th century as well, um, we see increasing prominence given to uh, words relating to virtue. Okay. Um, and that prominence, uh, is sustained past the execution of King Charles I, and even uh, for a, a couple decades after the uh, Glorious Revolution. Yeah, so virtue matters in, in civic discourse, um, and it seemed to be especially important leading to the Glorious Revolution. Yeah. Um, I have also here uh, words relating to liberty and commerce. Liberty mattered. Um, but it didn't, didn't attain, maintain the same level of prominence, it appears, as virtue, and um, at least for a short bit. And what I'll be arguing is that uh, the conversation in virtue actually led to increased respect for liberty and for commerce. So I'm going to point out how uh, uh, this, this emphasis on virtue the, and the shift in emphasis concerning virtue led to uh, uh, development of a culture that embraced uh, individual liberty and commerce, which is tightly uh, associated with individual liberty. Yeah. Um, for those who are, oh, no, that's not there. Okay, good. So you, we have to set the context and understand um, why did virtue matter? Why was virtue appearing in this context? Um, well, remember, uh, one of the forms of organization that was growing in prominence was the locally governed uh, congregational churches. Um, at the same time, we had, uh, at the beginning of the 17th century, we had the publication of the King James uh, Authorized Version of the Bible, which made accessible um, to Protestant groups who were tending to read, uh, uh, increasing literacy, um, uh, made the sort of participation in that religious order accessible, okay? Um, and within this milieu, we see emphasis on one passion, and this isn't just in the English-speaking world, this is across the enlightened world. The philosophers are concerned about passion. Um, some of you might think of a cognate uh, within, within um, uh, explicitly Catholic heritage of something like the seven deadly sins. So you could think of it this way, you say, well, what is antidote within this philosophical conversation to the passions? Everybody's concerned about it because the classical view, the Republican view, and this isn't just Christianity, but this is the Greco-Roman heritage generally, um, the, the classical view was something like if you get un, unvirtuous leaders or if you get virtu uh, uh, leaders who are captured by passion, then that is going to lead to the downfall of your society, right? And if you think about Roman history, it's very easy to uh, consider the, the reign of Nero and the sorts of, in the least, rumors, uh, but very, uh, more than that, of his uh, uh, moral tastes. Um, as being associated with the, the long run decline, right? Um, and you could think of other examples within that. Um, that was one view of the world is, is leader, leadership taken by passion uh, leads to the downfall of the society. Um, and so virtue amongst uh, classical philosophers, amongst uh, philosophers of the time received a prominent valuation, right? As being an antidote to passion. How are we gonna have good governance? Well, one s solution, which has been identified as the Republican view of virtue, is that we need virtuous leadership, okay? And this is gonna appear in the discourse 
um, is present in the discourse and going to appear um, amongst particular uh, uh, presentations of virtue. But here's the discourse arena, right? We have, you could think of society as an arena, right? We're all playing a game because it's only fair if we're playing a game. If we're, if we're not playing a game with fair rules, then we don't want to play. Right? This is how we avoid the breakdown of, of civil war um, and, and can actually have multiple nodes of power in society. And in, in the game of, of, of uh, the arena of politics and of discourse at the beginning of the 18th century, we have some major players. We have religious establishments. And this would include something like low church and high church is, is commonly referred to. Again, low church being like these congregations. Um, high church being the, uh, the Anglican establishment. Um, uh, in some sense, high church oftentimes refers to the Catholic church as well, but in English politics, that's a complicated thing. So we'll just refer to uh, the Anglican church uh, as being a, a major player in this. Um, in supporting uh, what were called the Societies for Reformation of Manners. Okay, and these societies for reformation of manners, saw, uh, one of the major tasks that they took upon themselves was to identify existing laws that enforce morality and bring them forward uh, to cases uh, where they're being violated. Okay. Um, we have a political division between the Tories and the Whigs, and this can get kind of complicated. Um, in some sense, you can think of the Tories as being on the Republican uh, virtue side. Um, they're, they're fighting. Um, they're emphasizing, however, explicitly dedication to the Constitution across society, okay? uh, and especially in their disagreements with the Whigs, who they said were not living up to the Constitution. Uh, the Whigs uh, were corrupt, and therefore they were harming our, our, our morals and our virtues. Okay? The, the Whigs on the other side said, well, um, corruption is endemic to society, and so the best we can do is engage in private virtue which leads us to, to Man, Mandeville, um, who actually sort of was skeptic of the whole thing and said, well, public virtue is just a manifestation of private interests, private passions, private vices, he uses the word. Um, people aren't actually virtuous, at least not most of the time. Yeah. So we could, re, we could reformulate it this way. Uh, we, could have, we have the public virtue camp, we have the private virtue camp, and we have the virtue skeptic. Again, public virtue says that um, publicly in discourse, we're engaged in processes that promote virtue. We want our institutions to promote virtue, um, and our leadership should be uh, promoting virtue on, on some margin. Um, and somehow that should trickle down either um, intentionally or, or passively to the rest of society. We have uh, the private virtue camp who one way or another says, well, actually, um, virtue isn't best promoted in public discourse, but rather we need to have a virtuous populace. Uh, people need to be dedicated to virtue, whether it, with, um, yeah, people need to be dedicated to virtue in their personal lives. And that will ultimately lead us to this view of industry as, as a, an antidote to passion. Industry, individual liberty, commerce. Okay, this is gonna be the, the direction of the discussion. And interestingly, it seems like Mandeville, who is the virtue skeptic, won the debate about at least about public virtue um, in the sense that his solution uh, or his disposition I think is most compatible even if people across the century still were thinking critically about private virtue. Yeah. And so just a, a quick overview, a, a brief overview about um, a little bit more detail about what was going on with each group. Um, the public, uh, in terms of public virtue, the Societies for Reformation and Manners, again, drew support from both low church and high church establishment, okay? at least initially. And so you could think, in, in some sense, uh, uh, these are active zealots who really want to reform society. And, you know, at different times in, in different histories, you see these sorts of groups appear. Um, in the U.S., for example, you see this across the 19th century emphasis on cultivating uh, uh, moral virtue as the, as the reformer sees it, uh, not as in the general sense, anyhow. Uh, so this group uh, drew a lot of support. Um, and again, we're very active in uh, bringing bring for prosecution uh, moral acts that violated existing laws. I think this is, is one way you can think about it. So it's, it's an institution that has a relationship uh, uh, with, with more powerful institutions, 
and initially receives report, uh, support from the king and the religious establishment, although as the, the conversations concerning virtue wear on in decades later, uh, they receive less support. Yeah. Um, we have public, the public virtue view of the Tories. Uh, and what actually was happening was that the, uh, the Tories led by Bolingbroke were upset at what appeared to be um, uh, a vice within the Whig establishment. Okay, and specifically, they, uh, some of the Whigs were enriched by the South Sea bubble through corruption. And uh, the Whigs were explicitly, explicitly using money from the court or the king's court uh, to promote their own politics. And they had a strong alliance with the court in that sense. Um, and, and this was something really that brought virtue front and center in political conversation. Clearly you aren't being virtuous and we can use the virtue hammer to uh, uh, promote the politics that we prefer and the politics that bring our group uh, um, uh, closer to, or more in, bring more influence to our group. Yeah. So. Again, we have the uh, private virtue of the Whig apologetics, which is interesting because pe some people sort of like move between camps uh, and, and um, the, for example, we're gonna look at Cato's letters and, and the authors of uh, the participants in that conversation, uh, one of them actually were writing actively uh, with the Whig establishment at one point. So you have like these interwoven virtue camps, right? But in, in terms of the Whig apologetics, um, the story was simple. Look, corruption isn't like a Whig issue. Whoever's in power is going to have corruption. And so since corruption is endemic to power structures, what we need is, is a virtuous population. Uh, we need to, to move the, the discourse down a level um, where it belongs. And this is really interesting because remember, I, I made this distinction early on. I said, we have this whole idea of moral community and moral order. And we have these communities engaged in the political process, which is more at the higher level of moral order. And they're saying, we want to see a particular kind of virtue. And the Whig response was uh, sort of like, I think a winning political argument in terms of its generality, um, you know, regardless of, of historically what happens, their argument is, is compatible with, with each community, even if it isn't exactly what each community is saying that they want. Okay. So I say, um, uh, Arnal, who was writing for the Whigs at the time, says, what have availed all our sumptuary laws, right? Because the, the moral groups are trying to prosecute these laws. Uh, what all those against gaming and dueling, what those against bribery, only to demonstrate how much more force there is in luxury, vanity, and avarice than there is in laws with all their penalties. It's really difficult for, for the, the most global governance organization to enforce morality, right? Because who's morality? Who's virtue? This is underneath the conversation. Again, so we have these moral communities that have particular views of virtue. They have to find a way to agree whether or not they explicitly recognize it, we're gonna see the solution is something that, that everybody can agree on, even if they're not happy with, with at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, how am I doing on time? Uh, two two o'clock, okay, great, that's, that's good, this is perfect. Okay. Uh, we have Cato's letters, which, which falls on um, something of like the Republic virtue side of, of this discussion, except um, that you start verging toward this idea of private virtue and looking at the significance of civic participation with private virtue. So Cato's letters reads, reads like a thoroughly classically liberal document, right? We're suspicious of, of power when it's concentrated. Uh, and we think the, the best we can do in society is to uh, promote industry and alongside of that, allow for private virtue at, at the local level Think, we think, you know, there's this idea of, of liberty and responsibility, right, um, that is, is absolutely present uh, in these ideas. And so it's not just that, that uh, we can do whatever we want, uh, but in having liberty and taking responsibility for property you own, and in taking uh, responsibility for local management of local property, right? So this is civic discourse at the local level, whether again, it's like the town, 
uh, whether it's the church that you're participating in, right? That gives you buy-in. And, and so responsibility is antidote. We have dispersed power. We have uh, dispersed property. Uh, and, and that is associated with responsibility at the local level. Yeah. Um, and so uh, uh, a couple nice ways of, of thinking about this that are discussed within the text. Um, the authors, Gordon and Trenchant, say, for all bodies of men subsisting upon their own substance or upon profits of their trade and industry, this really becomes really prominent, find their account so much in ease and peace and have justly such terrible apprehensions of civil disorders, which destroy everything that they enjoy. We're back to the Hobbesian problem, right? We're concerned about making sure that there's civil order, making sure that there's peace, and their solution is to allow for the liberty of managing your own property and managing your own associations. Yeah. Right? Because the problem is fundamentally, and this uh, is the core of the conversation, the appetites, therefore, of men, especially of great men, are carefully to be observed and stayed, or else they never stay themselves. Okay? If we can't deal with this problem of, of virtue personally in leadership, then we need struct governance structures that allow everybody else to make sure that leaders, the leadership is virtuous. Um, this is, is a fundamental solution to the problem of constraining the despot. Yeah. And, and interestingly, though, I said it was Mandeville that, that wins the day. I'm not going to read this whole, the whole piece here, but this is the, uh, his solution in his, in, in his uh, poem he presents, which makes it interesting to think about how they are pronouncing words at the time. Um, but toward the end, he says, while we the benefits receive, end of the first uh, the column here, while we the benefits receive, hunger's a dreadful plague, no doubt, yet who digests or thrives without, do we not owe the growth of wine to the dry, shabby, crooked vine? Yeah. So for, for Mandeville, the world is a corrupt place, but it's actually the, the simultaneous pursuit of everybody's interests of these, of these uh, men and women driven by passion uh, that, that lead to sort of a diluting of the negative effects, okay? And it's, it isn't to say uh, Mandeville thought that virtue was a bad thing, but he was always, he was suspicious of discussion of virtue. He was suspicious that virtue was just cloaked vice. And so he, he identifies, right, uh, in, in these different instances of virtue, uh, what appear to be public virtue, actually they're being motivated by private vice they're being motivated by these lower passions that everybody's been so concerned about containing well it's this social discourse this conversation we're engaged in in society in markets and otherwise this is what is is constraining those passions right and and at least pub, uh, leading to public benefits minimizing the damage right this starts sounding a lot more like the modern view of the world good and institutions, good rules, rule of law, allow everybody to pursue their self-interest, I think about Adam Smith, um, and, and allow us to avoid these problems. Yeah. So what happened? Well, this, this conversation about virtue gave way to this idea of industry, pursuit of interest, right? Passion gives you drive, and if you allow those passions to uh, uh, generate energy in the pursuit of interest, then we're going to actually uh, be able to serve one another rather than create destruction. Uh, so, you know, the, the saying, the idea is idle hands are a tool of the devil. Uh, uh, but if we're, if we're playing a game where we have the rule of law and we respect one, uh, we're able to respect one another according to the rule of law, then uh, these problems will sort of just work themselves out. Now, there's a lot there. And there's a lot to argue about there. So I'm not saying this is the final word, but this is sort of the idea that, that brings us to think, all right, well, laissez-faire. Everybody can just, in the words of Voltaire, tend to their own garden. And actually, I have the quote here from uh, Candide, if anybody's familiar with Candide. Uh, the closing section of Candide, after sort of seeing all the chaos in the world, the solution that Voltaire arrives at is that uh, every, every man ought to attend to his own garden, right? That's the idea. Um, you have your, your own sort of personal kingdom to tend to. Um, and 
this is all that matters. And so they're waxing about this Pangloss, who is sort of like the, the absurd optimist in the story. Uh, he, he starts waxing about how wonderful all of this is. And Voltaire, Voltaire it, after this, this passage, I didn't, I didn't include the response of Voltaire here, sorry, of Candide. Uh, but he says, but I still have to tend to my own garden. And so this is sort of the running theme at the end. Um, and this is modern liberalism as we know it, the liberal order. Um, it's, it, this is how we got here. I think it's a great case of how it is that communities who disagree about something figure out what it is they agree about, right? They, we, they develop the moral order. We can't agree on exactly how virtue works, but we can generally agree that public virtue is important, or at least in the, in the, the, the frame of Mandeville, pretending that we're virtuous is important because it helps promote our, our uh, self-interest. Okay, so this is what takes form for the remainder of the century from, you know, about 1730, 1740 onward. And of course, like pivot points are, are always sort of devilish to, to identify a specific period in time. But this is, is, is the general direction that it moves in. So I, I highly encourage you all, uh, the reading that I, I passed on for this was Hirschman, who, who I think is really interesting to approach from this view because he was, he's not like an out and out laissez-faire guy, but I think he does a fantastic job of representing this conversation. Um, and he gives some thoughts at the end saying, well, we had some unintended consequences. This is in the third chapter of the book. Um, we, have, we have some consequences that weren't anticipated in this formulation of virtue. Um, and this, this is basically what dro has, is driving a lot of the conversation today, right? If we understand this is where it, how we arrived to this idea of laissez-faire, idea of personal liberty and personal responsibility, we can understand um, the socialist response to it, for example. Um, the, the Marxian response, but also other, other varieties of socialism as, as saying, well, that was a great dream, but in, in the terms of Marx, um, the bourgeois system leads inevitably to the proletariat revolution because it generates problems that, that, dis, that, that disassociates uh, uh, the proletariat from uh, uh, both property ownership and I don't think Marx goes in this direction, but I think some, some people in the conversation go in this direction of property ownership and civic participation. Okay, we understand this is where we arrive, how we arrive there, then we have some insight into like, this is what that conversation is. And I'm going to touch on that a little bit more before we're done here. But what, what we miss now is that Adam Smith moved the conversation from passion, we had passion to interest and interest operating as at least emulating virtue, bringing bring the projection of virtue, simulation of virtue, even if it's not true virtue. Okay. Um, depending on you know, who's, who's taking this argument. You could argue that it, it was promoting virtue, uh, but at least we have a virtue-like society. And so now we've dealt with this problem of virtue, uh, we sort of collapsed passion and interest. And now it's self-interest is, is the name of the day. And from Adam Smith onward, I'm an economist, we, uh, the, the whole system that we deal with is, is saying, what does the world look like when people pursue their self-interest under particular circumstances? under particular institutional constraints. Okay, and this is, is, ends up being the domain of, of economic analysis. But there's this other part here, and Adam Smith was a moral philosopher, so it's not like it was lost on him. It's not like you know, he, he, uh, he just threw virtue out the window, because he certainly did not. Um, but the work of Smith did such a fantastic job of, of showing the, the value of self-interest uh, and the significance of self-interest to, uh, to production, social organization, uh, mar uh, organization and markets, uh, that this has been the prime emphasis. And so you can see uh, with the, these uh, words, I have here the, the, uh, the, the sets of words that I used for that initial picture here, uh, for virtuous words, freedom words, and commerce words. Um, and individual words, uh, if you look at the, their texture, they, they tend to follow this. This is why I have the scatter plot here. So when you see dots in the background, those are all these individual words here. Um, you can see with the change in the prominence of these word types, um, how emphasis was changing, right? So virtue did a lot of the grunt work. And then exactly at that time that virtue and public discourse was starting to wane, we see uh, a sort of uh, slow burning fire under the under, uh, engine of liberty. And, and that con uh, converts ultimately to uh, sustained uh, progress in respect for commerce.
Okay. Of course, I'm not the only one that's arguing this. Uh, the, the um, you know, as, as an economist, um, this was first brought to my attention by Deirdre McCloskey, who has a, a trilogy of works. Um, um, you know, there's a lot of work. I, I noted Ostrom on polycentricity, these competing nodes of power. But they, they, all these arguments sort of work together um, to help us understand how it is that um, these ideas evolved. And so I'm, I'm making a causal argument here, right? It's that debate of virtue that, that once we figured out that we couldn't agree, allowed us to set the terms of the moral order. And the terms of the moral order, at least for the day, was, was individual liberty and commerce, okay? Individual liberty in the, in the light, in the heart, uh, uh, as presented by Cato's letters, um, very much, right? Looking for constraint on, on despotism, constraint on the power of, of, the, of the executive. That's how we think of that. And commerce as, as promoting that virtuous behavior from the entire population. So we are suspicious of, of the power structure. That's the liberty argument, right? And commerce makes us better. Um, and, and, and we have to have that local power anyway to engage in commerce, right? That property ownership, each man tending to his own garden or sort of his own minor kingdom. Uh, within the rule of law, as we refer to today. Um, that's what is, is showing up here from about 1725 to 30 into uh, uh, the, the latter part of the, the century, right? This increase in prominence of liberty and commerce. Yeah. So that, that brings us all the way to sort of the start of the United States. We can understand where do these ideas, how were they generated? Um, why was it that we ended up on liberty and commerce? And not even though we started from virtue, but also we can we can still think about today, like what is the significance of virtue in civic discourse, right? What is it that we lose when we remove virtue from the conversation? And I think it's it's that we lose our source of agreement. Yeah? We all agreed when I say we, right? Look, looking back historically, everybody agreed pretty much that virtue mattered, or at least acting virtuous mattered. Yeah, and but now we're living in a context where maybe that doesn't set the rule of the game. Uh, maybe, it, maybe it does and maybe it will, but I think it, you know, at times like this there are always potential turning points where we say, are, do we have civic discourse? And some might argue civic discourse is breaking down. We don't really have good civic discourse. We have more polarization than we had for a long time. Some might argue, well, maybe that's just uh, means it's time for the, 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 the dual party structure to sort of reconfigure in the U.S. It's been a long time since that happened. Uh, and so that will fix the problem, maybe. But, but what we need when we have that configuration is respect for the rule of law, respect for human dignity, and viewing uh, the other side as being actually important. Because the opposite of virtue is, is what uh, Buchanan referred to as moral anarchy. It's the using of other persons as means, reducing them to means, without viewing them as ends in themselves, right? Whereas virtue promotes the opposite of that. Virtue says, as a matter of fact, before I even engage with you, you are valuable in and of yourself. And I ought to address you appropriately, just as a fundamental belief that, that I have to value you as a human being in the same way that I at least value myself, right? This is like golden rule, sort of love your neighbor as you love yourself, uh, uh, um, universalism here. Um, and you can, again, you can see that in, and ultimately, I think the way that virtue ended up being discussed and accepted within the context, but we lost touch with that. I think it's really clear in our discourse we've lost touch with that. We're willing to step outside the, the bounds of what would be virtuous, and I think this is true on both sides of the political conversation right now. Uh, I think it's something that should concern us and something that we ought to be addressing. How do we address that? Well, civic participation. Well, responsibility in what you own why not right and so that means that's all margins of society this isn't just this isn't an argument saying well markets are going to solve this problem on their own no personal responsibility and engagement with processes of local governance are going to be the beginning of that and the more that we participate the more we have buy-in right the more that we can uh, uh more that that will matter at the national level Right? Because at the end of the day, politics is sort of just a projection of the most common thing, right? What is, is driving us in, in our groups? And right now, the most common thing seems to be one divided 
right? We have sort of like two concepts of, of what the world should look like. And the most common thing doesn't appear to me to be virtuous, uh, but I, I could be, uh, maybe I could be convinced otherwise. Uh, you know, that should be the world that we want to live in. Right, and with that, that's it. Um, I really appreciate your inviting me here and, and I'm happy to discuss any questions that you all have.